You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we have a really special guest. Uh, We have Evan White. Evan White has been fishing the Piedmont BFL division this year, and he's been doing pretty good. Just to kind of give you guys some numbers here. Uh, for the Piedmont Division, he has finished in Smith Mountain Lake, twenty-first with thirteen thirteen. He tied. He tied for. He tied up. Let's restart that over again. In the Smith Mountain Lake tournament, he tied for twenty-first with thirteen thirteen. Then the next tournament at Kerr Lake, you had eighth place with fourteen pounds. High Rock fifth place with eighteen two, and then just recently on the James, you tied for seventh with fifteen oh six. You have nine hundred sixty-three points leading angler of the year with an 18 point lead going into the super tournament evan damn that's a that's a great year oh yeah i'm very happy with it how it's going so far before we before we get into it just kind of a little back history um looking on the mlf website on your bfl uh history you kind of hopped into one in in 2020 so and we're in 2023 now that's a three-year a three-year difference have you just really gotten into this or did you just not start tournament fishing until 2020? I started tournament fishing in about 2018. Uh, a family friend of mine invited me to fish a cat trail tournament. If you're familiar with those. Mm-hmm. And, uh, this year is the first year I actually decided to hop into the BFLs. Okay. And, uh, that's really I fished, cool. uh, the ABA open series. If you're familiar with that in 2021 and one AOI for that one. Dang, dude, that's freaking awesome! Yep. So you are nor- you're used to this kind of success. Did did you fish at all in like high school tournaments or college events or things like that? My uh, high school didn't have a fishing team, and uh, I went and just went to community college, so I didn't have a opportunity to fish college. I, I still really have wish community- eligibility, so I might oh, still it. do it. I just haven't decided yet. <sighs> It's, it's weird to me because baseball is a great example of community college is such a great place to find talent. And I remember when I was playing for Hagerstown Community College uh, before I made the jump to a four-year school, you go down south and you play some of these JUCOs down in Florida and you get your butt kicked because there's so much talent. Yeah. And it's really a shame that you don't have community college you know, fishing opportunities. That's right. That'd be pretty cool. It really, it really would be. It's something that has to, it's something that somebody has to make happen at some point, because I know like D3, D1, D2, they all play against each other. So why not extend that to community colleges? Um, But I don't know that that's something, that's something for definitely for another conversation. But when, when did you know that you wanted to make a run at this thing and actually fish all the events? Um, the last couple of years, I've done pretty good locally, like on Lake Gaston and Bugs. And I just really wanted to see this year where I'm at. Because I know that in the BFL, you're fishing against all the local hammers on their ponds. I wanted to see how it could hang with them guys. Well, see it sounds that. like you fish most of the lakes that the hammers fish, right? I mean, Kerr, Gaston. I mean, w- would would Smith or High Rock, or the James, which one of those events were you the most wary about? The James. James River because uh, I've never fished a tidal fishery before until this year. Really? Yeah, it was my first That's time. Insane. There. That's insane. Okay, I did, wouldn't I wouldn't have pegged that because I think you know being able to, I've gone down to High Rock, I've gone down to 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 Kerr. I, a lot of those lakes are pretty daunting. I mean, did did you looking at the schedule have one lake that you were like, this is my bread and butter, this is the one that I want to make hay on? Bugs Island is the one I've fished the most. Yep. It's really? actually the only one on the schedule I'd ever been to until this year. I've never been to High Rock or Smith Mountain or the James. Holy shit, dude. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it was my dude, first that... time at all these places this year. So then, you know, honestly, I, I really want to walk through it with you. Um, you, know, you. You get to the first event of the year, Smith Mountain Lake. What were your thoughts going into that event? Just wanted to make the regional, catch, catch a couple fish, get some points. And make the regional where my thoughts going into it and then got on some fish out deep live scoping now i was like maybe i can do pretty good in this you know 
Did you have a plan of attack going into it to Smith? Were you like, I just want to ride shallow and try to get them as they move up? Or was it like you said, you're just going to live scope and fish? fish well, a lo- I know a lot of people like to fish the muddy water, you know, cranking and jigs and stuff like that. So I wanted to stay away from those pressured fish and, you know, stay in that clear water, jerk bait, say rig, stuff like that. Okay. And, and that's honestly what I think ended up happening there for, for a lot of the people. Um, so you, you get out of that thing with a a really solid 21st place finish. And, and I, I love how you can look at a season builds out for better or worse. And I've had people on that have had a good season that, that have, have had a bad season, but it's always like a death by a thousand cuts or you're building something really cool one piece at a time. You're going to Kerr now. That place is very interesting. <laughs> With all the people that I've had on the show talking about that place, I feel like it's got, I don't know, it just doesn't have enough fish in it, it feels like sometimes, where it's such a big body of water, but it has the the, the volume of fish of a local farm pond. And so that can make yeah. it very frustrating there. Lots of small had, fish, dude. Lots of small fish, dude. I, I forget, I think it was Trent that I had on the show, and he's like, yeah, it's like a, you, you're looking for like a cur unicorn, which is anything over four pounds. Um, going into that tournament, what was your plan of attack? Um, it was May, so I figured there's a bunch of different things going on, and I decided to key in on the shad spawn. And I found really? one, one area that I liked, and the shad were spawning, and then I spent most of the day there. Did you feel like you could actually have that? There'd be enough weight there to just to have that one area for the whole tournament, or were you looking for more places as well? Well, that was, I knew that was gonna be my limit spot, and the fish uh, were quality enough that I decided to stay there all day and coal up you, there wasn't a so lot of fish there but it was some quality fish so the shad spawn lasted all day um well the shad were spawning in the bushes in one area nut bush so that kind of drew them into the bushes and then later on in the day they'd be in the shade lines where the shad were spawning at you know at that mm. morning so the shad spawned to about i'd say about eight thirty. wow okay but it kept Dang. the fish up there and then did you have all of your weight early in the morning or was it just more of like uh, just one at a time throughout the day? I had about 10 pounds pretty quick. And then it was like about every hour or so catch a two and a half to three pounder and slowly work your way up the rest of the day. Did you ever feel like you had solid weight for the top 10? I mean, 14 pounds on most places, you're like, whatever. But Kerr, it's like, shit, this might actually be enough. Yeah, for Kerr, like... I figured that might be enough for a top 10. Just only that place. That's the only place on the schedule I would be comfortable with 14. Ah, the place is so freaking weird. I just, I don't know what has to be done to get, now, honestly, if the hydrilla would come in, that'd be one thing that'd be nice or any vegetation would help a lot. But stocking, I guess, I, I don't know. It's so weird because it's such a big place for it to suck as much as it does. Yeah, it is. But it gets a ton of pressure. Like during March, April, May, it's a tournament every weekend, usually with 100 plus boats, sometimes more than one of them on one weekend. That is crazy because I know like the Potomac and the James are a lot that are that way too. And it's fascinating how some places just handle the pressure better or Gunnersville. I mean, that place gets the shit knocked out of it and it can produce. I don't know. It's just that's so weird. But yeah, I mean, going into Kerr, leaving Kerr, you had 14 pounds, you got eighth. That's when did it start creeping in that you were, this was something special because two tournaments in, is that when you started to think about it? Yeah. And then especially going into high rock, you know, I was like, if I can survive of this lake that I've never been to before, then I might can make something special out of the year. High rock is interesting. I had some, I had some friends that went down there and fished that. And I went down there just to, to watch and play around and, that's a small lake, especially when you're going from Smith Kerr to High Rock. How did you break that place down in practice? I decided that I was going to stay on the lower end near a flat, I think it's Flat Swamp Creek, Creek yeah. and Abbott's Creek. And uh, I really thought I was going to be fishing deep down there from what I'd heard. So I went down on a Wednesday and I actually, I did some idling, found some brush piles, rock piles, and I caught them pretty good Wednesday, just throwing like a shaky head on those spots. So then the next day, Thursday, I tried to do it again and didn't get bit at all. So then I went shallow 
and caught some fish around docks and lay downs and stuff and did the same thing Friday and decided to do that in the tournament. I wonder why the deep bite there wasn't on. It didn't seem like a lot of people in that tournament caught them deep. I'm not sure. I think that just something to do with them pulling water. And I heard that they didn't pull water on Saturday is what I ended up hearing. Mm, that could but be I it. could be wrong on that. No, that that sounds about right. I mean, there, I guess, is that a hydroelectric dam? I wonder if that is a hydroelectric dam. I guess that's why they'd pull water. I know if they don't pull water, I think it's like Swampy Creek you're not going to get into because that damn thing, man, if that water gets up there, there's no way in hell you're getting a boat in there. That, yep, that one and uh, Abbott's Creek too. Yeah. Abbott's, yep, Abbott's. You you mentioned before, like earlier on, about using forward-facing sonar. I mean, would you consider yourself more of a a shallow water guy or an o- or an open deep water guy? I used to be primarily shallow, but I got live scope in 2021, and I've spent a lot of time with it, and feel like I feel pretty confident with that now. That's what made me a better offshore fisherman. So, so was I, that a go for it? I'd, I'd call myself a half and half. I'm, I can either way. I'm comfortable both ways. So with that said, was it a hard decision to go from, I'm assuming, let's say deep at Smith, right? Deep-ish at Kerr, and then you wanted to go deep at High Rock, but then you made an audible to go to Docks. It was hard to change from what I'd been doing in other tournaments, but here on Lake Gaston, we have a lot of Docks, so it was something I'm fairly comfortable with. So it was kind of like fishing familiar water, you know, similar anyway. How do you break down a lake that has so many docks? Because it to me it almost reminds me of if you're on a very uh, grassy lake and you have miles of matted vegetation, I, you can't fish them all. It feels like in a day. No, not at all. It's it's hard to do, but I usually like I just pick one creek for the day and then try the main creek stretches, first second docks going into the pocket, some on the flat point some on steeper banks and they just kind of go from there depending on how you're getting bit how much time do you like to spend on a dock not many casts at all i mean like one cast one to two casts oh wow damn man you you are efficient especially on those high rock docks because you know this i didn't catch any on the floating part of the docks just the walkways so uh it, it wasn't many casts. It was like two, po- you know, the last two posts. I just make one or two flips and go to the next one. And then when did you make the, the, the audible to docks? Was it the last day of practice you said? Yeah, I, had, I got a few bites at the end of the day, Thursday, after I realized the deep bite had died. And then Friday morning, I tried it again and caught some good fish. Out of one creek or was this a pattern that you had at this point? Um, I caught some out of uh, a couple of different creeks, but Abbott's okay. Creek had the better quality so i spent most of my tournament day in abbots so then friday night while you're while you're chilling were you thinking no deep bite at all i'm going straight docks or were you going to give the deep bite a chance and then switch over i gave it a chance because you know it's one of those things that's if you don't fish it you're going to think in the back of your head what if i what if i would have fished it you know caught some good fish but i went and checked two spots in the tournament and I didn't get bit and went right back to Abbott's Creek, back to fishing shallow. How long did you give yourself? What kind of leash? I've, I've uh, I fished deep for about an hour. Probably. Oh damn! Okay, good. So yeah, you didn't you didn't waste much time at all. No, it, it wasn't. It just wasn't happening that day. The deep bite at all. How long did it take you to start catching them? Then when you switched to docks. Um. Well, I started. Well, I actually started shallow in Abbott's that morning and caught. My first fish was a four pounder, which made me feel really <laughs> good. Yeah, it makes you feel really good when that happens. <laughs> and then I, uh, it was a stick in the water in between docks, and I caught three fish off one little twig. And one of those was a four pounder. I'm like, oh, it's going to be a good day. That's and then it slowed down day. from there. It really slowed down. So you had like, what, 10 pounds before 10 o'clock? Yeah, it was, I had a good bag early. I had Dude, two four pounders awesome. and two little ones. Did you find that twig in practice or is that something you found the day of? 
I found it a day of. Which, I mean, it's something you look at in practice and be like, this, no, that's not going to be anything on that stick. You know, it's not something you're going to remember for the tournament. It was kind of weird. That is so weird. But it's honest, like, when it's your time, it's your time. You probably could have, like, slept in late and still, you know, would have cracked a top 10. Uh, what what were you throwing that day? Oh, uh, just flipping a Texas rig, a uh, Zoom Z crawl. Yeah, that's freaking awesome. That's freaking awesome. I mean, I, I, I hate dock fishing again, but I didn't grow up around a lot of docks. And the fact that you were able to break down that area and those docks get pounded to snot. Um, yep. And the fact is that wasn't even your main pattern. It was that you you spent, what, a day-ish on that and you were able to figure out an area? That's yeah, impressive. And um, I re-ran the same water a couple of times in Abbott's during the tournament because I said, well, I caught a fish in here. Somebody else is going to come behind me and catch a fish. So why don't I just go behind myself and, you know, try to catch one? Because those docks get pounded, you know, probably get fished 20, 30 times a day on the low end, I would say. When when do you want to recycle water and when do you not? Do you have a gut feeling of, of when you like to do that? It just depends what, what time of year it is and what the fish are doing. I feel like those fish would uh they were just always moving i feel like constantly moving up i'm not sure why they're moving up that time of year but i just feel like they were moving up good yeah that was a really weird time to have that tournament but i guess that's that's usually when they have it on the schedule um and honestly you caught some of your best i think you had 18 pounds so was it you had your two fours did you catch another big one Oh, at the end of the day, I threw a buzz bait in the shade line and caught another four pounder. And that that's when you're like, dang, it really is my day. <laughs> Did you think you had a chance to actually win it? And looking at the previous weights before the tournament, I knew it could be a chance, but I felt like they bit really good. So, I, you know, I didn't have high hopes. I really thought going into it, it would take 18 to 19 pounds because the last two times they were there, I think it was around there. But damn the weights were big this time which was really shocking yeah i think it was 220 plus pound bags weighed in maybe yeah three. yeah but and what's weird about that place too is it kind of suffers from the cur thing where it's like not every the weights drop off there a lot and it's almost like the the opposite of cur i feel like everybody catches a fish at cur but here it's like it, it drops off the face of the earth when you look at the weights yeah that's right and it feels like if you catch one it's going to be a good one though yeah not a lot of small fish no no there's not a lot of small fish in that place but you got a top you got a top five the voices in my head would be so bad i probably need a lobotomy at this point <laughs> that that it would be a, a holy shit what's going on here this is not good i know what you're talking about <laughs> and then it's like on top of that the best tournaments are behind you of places you're feeling comfortable now you have to go to the james river the title Yep. Uh, what's in your head leading up to this event? I just want to survive this event on the James is what I was thinking. Hopefully catch a lemon. Did it start playing with you a little bit about the points and everything? Yeah, because I was in practice, I was more worried about catching, finding a limit spot than I was trying to find a winning area, you know, somewhere I could win at. Hmm. That is so fascinating to me because... I grew up when I fished high school, when I, when I was part of the high school Bassmaster Club, the old guy there was like, you always got to fish to win. You always got to fish to win. But then you look at, at people like yourself, the Brandon Polonix, and they're like, dude, just sometimes you got to you gotta play for par. Just get a limit. And it's yep. so weird that there are so many people that are like, I'm just going to lock a jigger or a swim bait in my hand. I either win or I don't. But the guys that survive and cash checks have that mindset that you explained where it's like sometimes you just got to putt and just get it in the damn hole. Don't be too fancy. That's right. Yep. And looking at really so far on, on the schedule, that's kind of what you did. It was never, and I could be wrong, but you never tried to swing for the fence. It was just be solid. Yep. Try to catch five solid fish. Yep. And so let's, let's get into that a little bit more about the James. What kind of research, cause you've never been to title. So what did you do leading up to this event to get prepared? Well, I looked into the, tide charts for the week you know see how it was going to be like the wednesday thursday friday leading up to it and what it was going to be different about it saturday 
And then during practice, when I'd uh, get bit or get bit in the area, I'd, you know, write it down what time it was and what the tide was doing, how the water looked, stuff like that. James River is not High Rock. It's a big-ass place. Oh, it's uh, huge. How many days did you want to give yourself to practice? And then how did you want to break this down being your first time there? I wanted to practice a week for this one, but I had some boat oh issues. Oh, no. And, and uh, I got to practice Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And Wednesday, I actually stayed up near, uh, not near Richmond, but Hopewell area. And it was just blown out, you know, from all those, that rain and all that they had. And I didn't get a bite Wednesday. It was just a wasted day of practice. Not wasted because I eliminated water, but there was no need to even fish up that way. What kind of boat issues were you having? Um, I, I hit a, uh, hit something on a, on the Chowan River here and cracked a fiberglass. Oh. Um, had to get it patched. Good Lord, dude. <laughs> And the James is not even better for that shit, too. Yeah, I, I, I kind of expect to do the same thing there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I've had many of friends that have lost a lower unit on the James. Uh, so so you're up at the Holtpool area. What? In, and you don't have to give away the juice, but generically narrowing it down. Like, How did you narrow it down to places that you wanted to really target? Um, From the, from the first day, I was just fishing like the backwaters and ponds and stuff up the river the mouths of the ditches because I felt like with the tide coming out, you could catch fish in the mouths of the ditches and I never got bit doing anything like that. So then on the second day, I decided to put in at Jordan point and run some of those bigger creeks down, you know, towards the chick. And on Thursday, I found a Creek called Heron Creek and I felt like I could get a lemon in there come tournament day. Cause I, I got a lot of bites. And then I just hit a few more creeks and then didn't ever get bit again that day. So it made you think that Heron was the one? For the for the limit, yep. I was like, maybe I can start in here, get a quick limit, and then go from there. Were you sticking everything that, that bit in practice, or were you shaking off and then just kind of scouting that area out? On the James, I was I was sticking everything that bit. Good for you know, to see how big they were. Uh, that's, that's, you know, it's so weird. Okay. Huh. Did you ever go into the chick? I did for about an hour on Friday. And I realized that if I wanted to fish the chick as big as it is, I should have spent my whole week practicing there and turned chick. on back around. How many people went into the chick? Do you know? Like, I feel like the chick has always a cult following that go into it. Yeah, it was a lot of boats going by me headed to the chick. It went farther than I did. And then my co anger is a local there, and he said it was an 80 boat club tournament or some kind of tar- team tournament at a Route 5 that day. So hmm. I bet it was crowded in there. Yeah, that place gets pummeled to hell. How did you know to go to that creek? Well, that's the thing. On um, Friday, I uh, went and practiced Chip Oaks Creek, and I got two bites in there, and they were both four pounders. So in my head, I'm thinking, do I go start in there and try to win the tournament or do I start in Heron Creek and try to get a limit? So I went back and forth and finally decided to start in Heron Creek. And it was about 30 boats that started in there and I only caught one fish. So then I got out of there quick and said, well, I'm going to go on down to Chip Oaks, you know, try to catch five of these big ones. And I, I got three of them. Took all day, but I did catch three of those good ones in there. So the first, you, go, you go to Heron Creek first. First thing in the morning, you blast off. You, you go to Heron Creek. You get one keeper, correct? Yep. You got one in the boat. Cool. Yep, it's, it, it's a start. It's something. But there's the, and this is something else that we'll, we'll get into later, but you have the, the tidal body of water traffic jams where boats are on top of each other like crazy. Yep. You get one, but then you, you, you leave. Then you, you get three more. How do you feel at this point? I felt pretty good catching those three. There were three good ones that I caught in Chip Oaks. So I decided to stay in there the rest of the day. And I really just caught one more keeper. And I didn't call much. Because the tide was was falling when I went in there. I think it was about 9 o'clock when I got there. And caught the fish really quick. My co-owner caught some good fish. And it kind of died. 
So then by that point, so then you had your four by what time? Probably 10.30 or 11 o'clock, something like that. That's still pretty good, though, time-wise. I mean, it doesn't feel like... It, if you have four before noon, I feel like you, you're still calm that you just need one more. It's a lot different than if you get four at, like, 2 o'clock. That's right, yep. But you still have that thought in the back of your head, man, what if I don't get another bite the rest of the day? Oh, my God, yeah. And especially it's your first time on Tide. Like, did... Did that really freak you out at all during the event, like dealing with those swings? I wouldn't say it freaked me out, but I've definitely had it in the back of my mind. You know, what if I, what if I'm here at the wrong time, or what if I should be here earlier? Stuff like that, stuff that a local would know that I wouldn't know yet. I think people, when they think about Tide, the biggest thing that hurts it, and it's funny because I just had an interview the other day with a guy from Carolina. And he talks about the Carolina culture of running and gunning. And yep. I talked about like, well, that's the problem with t- title is the, anti- it's the opposite spectrum. It's sitting and camping. And it's so hard, I think for people to be able to flip like that, to go from, I'm going to hit 500 points to like, I'm going to sit on this grass patch until the tide gets right. Cause they're yep. here. Yep. And, you have to wait for them. Yeah. And, and that's, so once you had, you know, you're four and you're looking for that fifth, were you thinking about running and gunning or just, I'm going to camp and wait them out? In my back of my head, I wanted to run and gun and try some other stuff, but I knew my best chance of catching another good one was in Chip Oaks. So That's I, smart. I stayed in there. That's really smart, dude. And then, you know, when you get that fifth one in there, how much weight do you think you have? Oh, uh, I thought I had about 13 pounds is what I thought I had. My co owner said they were bigger and he was right, luckily, but I, I was underestimating them. What were you catching them on? Uh, same thing. Flipping a Texas rig Z crawl. Is that your go-to? Sometimes. <laughs> if you hit them on the head with it, they'll bite it. Were you using braid or fluorocarbon? What's your setup for that? Uh, 20 pound Seaguar and Vizix. Really? Dang. Yep. Going with the fluorocarbon. That's insane that you never tried to whip out a chatterbait like everybody else and their brother that fishes these tidal places. I thought about it. Yeah. But why didn't I you? It, I threw it in practice some and I never got bit on it. So the only thing you got bit on was was the Z crawl? Yep. And uh I had a few top water bites, frog, buzz bait. But uh Not- I think I had one buzz bait bite at the end of the day on the way back up the river. I stopped in a ditch. It was like a three or four pounder and I jumped them off. So that that one hurt. Oh my god. <laughs> I think oh it would have put god. me top three. Dude. When when in the day was that? That was at like one thirty. It was a oh, that's a gut punch. Yeah, it was it was one of those. You're like, well, that was my last second chance to do really good. You know, was there anything that you could have done differently on him? I could have made a better cast because I think I was over a limb when he ate it. I might not have got a, the hook to penetrate right. You're like the third person I've talked to in the past month that have talked about the buzz bait. And that's so weird because I feel like the buzz bait disappeared for a while because of the stupid whopper plopper. And now I feel like yeah. the buzz bait's coming back or just more people are doing well with it again. I'm not sure. I've had pretty good luck with it this year, but really the last two years I've been catching some good fish on the buzz bait. Now, do you like a stinger hook or do you, do you feel like that's not even important in my arsenal? I don't have a stinger hook on mine, but hmm. it could come back to bite me one day, but I, I don't throw a stinger hook. Usually when I'm throwing it, I'm going to throw it when they're eating it, but if they're just halfway eating and I'm not going to throw it. So if they're not eating it all the way, what would you go to? Maybe like a popper or something with treble hooks. Ooh, popper. That's another one that needs to get more, more attention. I haven't thrown a popper in forever, which is probably my own fault, but it's just so damn slow. I don't yeah, want to fish a top one. It really is. So you get your five, you get in. Where were your thoughts with what you had? I was really happy because I knew it would probably keep me in a points lead unless some of the guys behind me really caught them. That, that, was, that was my main concern. I wasn't even thinking about the top 10 again and all that. I was just happy to be competing in the points still. You crack a seventh place. You have an 18 point lead, but the problem is where the super tournament is. I think this is kind of funny actually, where it's like the thing you hate is where you gotta, you gotta cinch the deal in. 
Yep. Are you going to be, you going to be practicing at all? Yeah, I'm probably going to spend some time up there, at least out on around. I, I plan to fish offshore in that one. So offshore in the Janes. Call can be tough in September, really tough. Where, uh, September, is it late September or early September? It's, I think, the second week in September, if I looked at it right. Second week of September? Let me make sure I double check it. That's why I got all this stuff right here. Uh, schedule super tournament. Do, do, do. All right, let's go right here. Schedule. September 9th to the tenth. Okay, yeah, that's gonna suck. Oh <laughs> God. Yep. How much weight do you think that'll take? To win, it'll probably take about fourteen to fifteen a day. To make the first day cut, I'd say ten pounds at the highest. <laughs> you could throw a Ned rig and almost do something with that. That's insane. Yeah, it's, it's bad. I'll, I'll have my spinning rod in my hand for that one. <laughs> Why don't they go to Gaston? I feel like Gaston is big enough. If you can go to High Rock, you can go to Gaston. Um, I'd love for it to be on Gaston. I think that we just don't have a boat ramp big enough to support 130 to 150 boats. That is so stupid. That is really the weights would be better than Kerr, I think. Oh, but... they'd be way better. Yeah. How's they'd probably that... take 20 pounds a day. Damn. How how is that place fishing right now? Um. Right now, it's starting to get good. The uh, big spotted bass are starting to bite. This past weekend, me and my dad won a, a wildcat tournament with 20, 20 and a half pounds of all spots. They're getting big. Is there blueback herring in Gaston? Not that I know of. Not, not, not as many that are in bugs, anyway. Because it's weird how... and that's I, There's blueback in Kerr. You got spots in Kerr. Yep. But they don't have the size, which makes no sense. Yeah, they haven't got big in Kerr for some reason. I, I think it's some that have been in there a long time that are like two and a half to three pound range. And then the last couple of years, a bunch of 12 to 14 inch ones have showed up. And uh, those haven't grown much over the last couple of years. I wonder if it's a different breed because I wonder if it's just the Alabama bass versus the spot and you got more of the runts in Kerr. Because, I mean, d does Kerr and Gaston, are they completely different or do they kind of fish the same? They're completely different because Gaston, the water stays, you know, fairly stable and then par you get going up and down all the time. Is there any vegetation in Gaston? Just shoreline grass, no no hydrilla. They killed all that just like everywhere else. I have no idea why they do that. I, 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 I remember going to Gaston when I was like 12. This is way back in the day. <laughs> And there used to be a lot of vegetation back in the pockets and stuff. And you could throw a swim jig and just, and just murder it. And yep. somehow someone said like, let's just get rid of all of it. And it's like, they're trying to make every lake, like Lake Hartwell or Lake Murray, just deep, clear and have pelagic moving fish. Yeah. That's really what it reminds me of something like Hartwell now. Have you, have you ever fished those places? I haven't. I was just going off research. It sounds the same. You would, you would love it. You really would. I mean, did did you get better at fishing for spots when you got live scope? Is that really when it opened up for you, Gaston? Oh yeah, I got live scope in twenty twenty one, and I spent a lot of time on Gaston and bugs using it, finding brush piles, offshore spots, stuff like that. I mean, that brush pile thing is absolutely the deal, and I don't know. It's just so interesting to me that that whole style. I mean, because it's fresh in my mind um, from my last conversation, but. It, the only way I feel like that style works is if you have time on a body of water. Like it takes time to have all the spots to be able to make that, that Carolina run and gun style work. And I think that's interesting because I, th I believe a lot of people try to implement it and they don't have the time on the water of the spots. Yep. And I think you get to have a lot of waypoints, <laughs> a lot of waypoints. Yeah. And that's when I think you needed to go with that Japanese style of like, I'm going to pick this cove and I'm going to sit here for four days and learn it. Because right. you can't, I can't beat you if you have 7,000 waypoints. But if I pick a creek arm and I just stay there, you could probably learn that thing pretty good in four days. Yeah, know what's going on in that area anyway. Yep. And with that said, 
are you going to try to implement more of a running gun thing on Kerr? Or are you just going to camp? Because this thing, are you going to try to win it? Or are you just trying to putt, so to speak? I'm going to make sure I get a limit. As I'm a running gun to brush piles and stuff like that, offshore spots with a drop shot until I get a limit. And then maybe mix in some shallow stuff to try to win it. Is there any op- is there any chance that you could have this thing wrapped up day one? I th- it depends how many boats are in the tournament because I have an eighteen point lead and they cut it at the check cut for the second day. So I think if I'm inside the top twenty after the first day, it'll be wrapped up. Will you actually go out day two if that's the case, or would you just start partying? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I might, I might party a little bit. He's like, to be determined. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll party uh, Sunday night after I win the tournament. How about that? We'll there, go out Sunday you, and try to win the tournament. There you go. You just, you just get the chorus cans out of the live well before before you go out that day two. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> what are your plans for next year? Next year, uh, not real sure yet. Uh, I'm thinking just do the BFLs at least one more year. And I'm thinking sometime in the near future, maybe try the Opens or something like that. Would you do the Opens or the the, the Coastas, out of curiosity? I haven't looked into the Coast as much, but I, I'd look into it before I decided some more. I, I don't know much about those. As I was thinking, like, which one has, I don't know which one has the better payout. I'd have to Google that again, because I feel like one of them, or maybe it's the, yeah, I don't know which one has a better payout, Opens or, or Coastas at this point. Cause that is, that is interesting. But then again, it's like, do you, how many years do you want to fish the, the BFLs and grow it? Because, you know, if you keep putting up these gaudy numbers, eventually you're going to have a crack at the all American too. That's right. Yeah. That's the goal. <laughs> yep. As you continue through this thing, like what part of your game do you want to kind of develop more? And you mentioned title. Is there anything else like deep, clear, small mouth, Florida grass stuff? I'd like to fish for smallmouth more. I, I mean, I've only caught like two or three in my lifetime, and that was practicing at Smith Mountain. So, You're kidding. Yeah, I've, never, I've hardly ever caught smallmouth. Are, is there no smallmouth creeks or rivers around where you're at? No, not at all. That's insane. Yeah. Dude, that's Smith Mountain's insane. the closest place for me. What was that river that you were talking about earlier that you were fishing? That you it's the Titanic uh, River. The, uh, there's no smallmouth in there for some reason. I mean, it might be one or two, but I've never caught one. Huh. You ever fished the Roanoke River down below uh, Roanoke Rapids? Oh, yeah. That's, that's big largemouth territory there. How the hell did that thing become good? That's such a weird one. Yeah, it, it's crazy how many big fish are in there. and It's always been like that, you know, talking to my dad and talking to, you know, other people, local guys that have fished it their whole life. It's always been big bass in there. How many boats can it hold tournament wise? If you had to like a tournament field, well, you can spread out um, as far as your gas tank will take you. So I, I feel like it could hold a lot of boats. I fished tournaments probably with 150 boats in it out of Plymouth, which is the lower end of the run out. You see, that would be a cool place to have a BFL or, or a bigger tournament. I just get bored of them always going to Kerr. Oh, yeah. It's a. Uh... You can run across the Albemarle. You can go to a bunch of different rivers. You know, they're all connected in the sound, in the Albemarle Sound. You can go up to the Chowan, this Alligator River, several different places. So you can spread out endlessly. Isn't that tidal? They say that place is more affected by the wind than it is the tide. It, it doesn't, the tide doesn't really affect that sound for some reason. That's so weird because you would think if you're fishing that or you have history on that, that the James wouldn't be as, as crazy, I guess. Yeah, but I haven't spent a whole lot of time down there either. It's just, there's no, there's nothing to do with the tide there. So that didn't help me much. Mm. Dude, I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Is there any sponsors, anyone that we can give a shout out to? Not really. Just give a shout out to my parents for uh, supporting me while I'm doing these BFLs. Well, yeah, and, ho- and hopefully we can get you some more sponsors uh, as you keep doing this in Crack Angler of the Year because it's – and I was looking at, too, um, before we started recording, uh, uh, something that's absolutely insane is you're leading AOI right now, and you have the least amount of money 
out of everything out of the top three. And that is so stupid to me with the payout system, the way it is where you you have Chris and then you have uh, Dennis Britt that have, you know, $4,000, $14,000. Granted, one of those is, is a win. But the fact is that you've cracked so many top tens. They just, I really wish the payout was better. The payout structure yeah. for the BFLs have to change. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I definitely agree. But all the money's in that top three. That's, that's your goal if you want to make some money in the BFLs. But it's weird how that is because it's like um, the the Hobie uh, Bass Open Series, it costs about the same amount to fish that as mm-hmm. the BFL, but the payout's like way better. And it's like, what? A lot the, better. That makes no sense. How the hell is that a thing? I have no idea. It doesn't make sense to me either, though. I know what you're saying. Because I'm not good at math, but it's like that something's not adding up at all. Where yeah, but, the money's going somewhere. <laughs> exactly. And it should be going back into your pocket because with what you're doing, like, is there an angler of the year like purse that you can win? I think it's $1,000. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, it should be more like five to 10 grand is what it should be. Cause I, that's, I think that that's like your entry fees back for the year. Yeah, <laughs> that's bullshit. I mean, it should be five to 10 grand. I think angler of the year. It, being consistent is probably harder than winning one. I really think that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But that's that's a that's a story for another day. Again, Evan, thank you so much for coming on. Again, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps out in the algorithm. We are the number one fishing show in the greater DMV, Maryland, and Virginia area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.